Hi everybody, welcome back. I'm Charlie. This is Raccoon Laboratory. We've been experiencing technical difficulties on a regular basis on these live streams, but especially today. Apparently my voice was very chipmunky and weird, and hopefully we fix that problem. So I'm gonna be checking in with my producer Daniel throughout the stream to make sure that that is fixed. Uh, but I think I'm going to go ahead with our stream today. And it looks like I'm getting the green light from Dan that it is better. Cool, thank you for being so patient. If you're tuning in, I really super appreciate it. And today is kind of a special episode. Um, we are going to be talking about composition and balance. And I'm actually a little nervous to do this one. I'm a little nervous to talk about this stuff, um, in part because I used to be much more of a painter. I still draw as a big part of my artistic practice. I feel confident talking about drawing. Um, but <clears throat> I think some of my ideas about how, uh, about how drawing works in the abstract, about how elements like composition in particular, how um, marks on a page relate to one another when they're not depicting something, but rather they exist on their own terms bounded by the square of the page. For me, a lot of those ideas are wrapped up in stuff from abstract expressionist painting um, from the middle of the 20th century in particular, but there are lots of artists who make paintings in this tradition. And basically my takeaways from that movement, um, although there, there uh, are many, um, involve thinking about paint as paint like thinking about a material that's on a canvas or a material that's on a page as, be, as being worthy of consideration on its own terms, not just in terms of what it is representing. So for example, the kinds of drawings we normally make on this channel by, uh, when we draw from observation, I'm trying to show you how to think about the object that you're drawing and make that connection, that meditation on that drawing connect to the marks you're putting on the page. So you're not so worried about what people are going to see. You're trying to not make too many decisions. You're mostly just focused on what you're drawing. You're looking at what you're drawing, really exploring it, really following it, and almost tracing it. Um, this is going to be really different because we're not going to be drawing anything in particular. We're not going to be trying to make an image that represents anything. We're going to just be putting marks on a page. And then I'm going to ask you to feel how those marks affect your mood, uh, not just emotionally. Emo uh, putting it emotionally maybe simplifies it. It's almost like kinesthetic. It's almost like your sense of balance, like that at any moment, you pretty much know where your feet are. You pretty much know where your hands are you pretty much know what's happening with your body. For me, it feels more like that. I can sort of get a physical sense of whether or not a drawing is balanced. So today, we're gonna take our page and we're gonna put some marks on it and we're gonna just like really pay attention to the way that it makes us feel. So <clears throat> to start out, we're gonna meditate just a little bit. And so today I want you to focus on your breath coming in through your nose and out through your mouth and in through your nose and out through your mouth. And today we're gonna do what's called a body scan. So as you're breathing, I want you to focus your attention starting at the top of your head. And I want you to slowly move your attention downward as you breathe in and out. And I want you to feel, what does that part of your body feel like? Like right now I'm at my neck. I feel like I've, my throat is a little bit sore. Maybe you notice some tenseness in your upper back. Maybe you feel really relaxed because you had a, a nice day. And so as you move that awareness down your body, 
I want you to just think about. Just notice how you feel. And we're going to go all the way down to your, all the way down your legs, to your ankles, and to your toes. And breathe in and out. If you get distracted, just bring your attention back to your breath. Just let the thoughts float by. Okay, I feel pretty good. Um, I wanted to focus on that meditation because here we're really going to be paying attention to our reaction to what is happening on the page. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to draw a black circle on this sticky note. I'm using my signature Sharpie. There it is. And then I'm going to open to a fresh page. And now we're going to put our sticky note somewhere on the page. Okay, so already there's a ton of stuff happening with this composition. With just one gesture, we've taken what was a blank page bounded by these edges, almost like a window, and we've introduced this big, bright, pink element. And so I want you to try putting a mark on your page where and just feel how it makes you feel so for example I feel right now that this mark is too far towards this corner for the page to feel balanced I can't exactly explain how but I'm going to give you lots of examples to try and test out this feeling in yourself and I think you'll start to notice that you feel many of these things too maybe in different ways maybe we have different preferences but if I put another sticky note with a black circle now the page is totally different now it implies quadrants now we have a pattern. Now we have a rhythm, right? And it's all bounded on one side. So we have a weight of marks all on one side of the page. So I'm going to try moving it over here. And again, it feels kind of wonky, but it feels a little more balanced. Now I'm noticing different things. So I'm noticing the distance between the edges of this sticky note, like notice there's a lot of white space up here, and the edges of this sticky note. There's not as much white space here. And again, I just want to make this clear. I'm not demonstrating any particular plan for making a good balanced image. What I want to show you is that the surface of the page what I'm going to start describing as the picture plane, the kind of world of your drawing, already has rules that are implied by every element you add to the page. And you're going to find pretty quickly that all kinds of wild uh, implications show up when you start adding and subtracting stuff like this. So let's keep going. So now I feel right 
now I feel that uh, I want this to feel a little more organized, right? Because we can orient, we can orient the square as being like super off kilter, but then it feels like it has tension with the edges of the page. But let's say I want that. Let's say I like that this is slightly off kilter because this one is turned so much and this one is turned just a little bit. This one looks like it was placed by mistake and this one looks like it was placed on purpose, which is totally weird because I had no plan for any of them. But I feel that. I want to fix this one. I want to make this one upright. So I'm going to do that. So now I'm also going to move it over here a little bit. Move it up a little bit. OK, so now something really different is happening. Now, this one seems really organized. I moved it up so that we would have a kind of like margin, a kind of squaring off of this edge right here. But this crooked one, now it feels like it's a little too far up. It feels somehow crowded in the middle here because there's so much space down here. So I think I'm going to shift it down a little bit. OK, and that brings us to the larger point that I'd like to make, which is that when I'm painting, and again, I say this stuff with some reservation because I know a lot of people who are very serious about painting. They take it very seriously and um, think of it as a kind of calling. <laughs> I don't know how else to explain it. Um, when I'm painting, this is how I paint. And I literally will add and subtract elements in relation to each other. And this kind of decision making is so exciting for me. I think it's scary for many people because there's literally no plan. But what I like about it is that you're discovering what the painting wants you to do as you go. And in this case, we're discovering what the drawing wants to be as we add elements to it. With a painting, it's, it's a little more fluid because it's easier to subtract elements from a painting than it is from a drawing, at least the way that I draw, especially on this channel with a Sharpie. So this is what, uh, th that's why I'm showing this to you guys because every move you make sort of implies your next move because You've taken the page and you've unbalanced it. You've kind of brought it off kilter. One of the ways I heard this explained to me um, in a painting class at Ohio State was that a perfect composition is just a cross dividing the page up into quadrants. And it's perfect because it relates to the page and the body. So it's natural as human beings for us to seek out a horizon line. We are constantly standing, sitting, and navigating through the world upright. And we uh, get disoriented without vertical or horizontal lines uh, with which to orient ourselves. Um, so it just makes sense that the distinction between verticality and horizontality uh, is, is, it's like a fundamental distinction um, from the perspective of the human experience. So what we're doing when we break up the picture plane is we're actually adding chaotic elements that disrupt this uh, quote-unquote perfect balance, which is what we want to do because we don't want a perfect balance. We want something that's slightly off-kilter or maybe a little weird. But we also want the drawing to hold together. We want it to feel unified. So one way of making a really good abstract drawing is literally by making a mark and then finding a way to rebalance the image. And you inevitably are going to sort of overcorrect because you've introduced this chaotic element. Um, one of, this is one of the reasons that I think it's important to draw by hand, because if you look at this drawing, my lines are wiggly. And my horizontal line isn't perfectly in the middle. And that's because I want those elements of chaos. I want that slight wobbliness, that little human factor. I, because sometimes uh, it's not just that it makes the art somehow feel more handmade even though it does and i think that's a quality people look for in art 
but it's also that that element of chaos gives the artwork new possibilities that little wobbliness opens up doors for you because it forces you to make different kinds of decisions than you would have made had the work not been chaotic so for example let's like get down to it and start adding some elements to our page i know this has been a lot of talk not a lot of drawing i hope you uh can follow along with me so let's just add a mark to our page a mark of any kind and i don't want you to make the same mark that i make because i want you to experience how different things can feel depending on what you put where. So to balance out this composition, I think I want to put something over here. I want to kind of ground it out. So I'm going to put this mark here. And then I think I want to have some kind of element in the middle. And I think I want to put something here. That feels pretty nice. It's not perfect, but it's pretty nice. I might put some more dots here. OK, so I want to talk about this composition a little bit. I've made just a few choices here. Um, I made them pretty quickly. I didn't really think too much about them. I think there are a number of things that are happening psychologically for me. And again, I'm just trying to explain my thought process, it's probably going to be different than yours, but I'd like to demonstrate that I really am just responding to my own feelings as I work through the drawing, and I want you to do the same. So as you put something on the page, I want you to just feel, what do you think it needs, and where? And don't really worry about why. I'm going to go into the why because I think it'll help you, but you don't need to know why you're drawing what you're drawing. All you need to know is what you want to draw. So in this drawing. I think on some level, in most drawings, I'm not just creating a perfect abstract picture plane. I think there's some part of my brain that it thinks gravity is real <laughs> in a drawing, which it isn't. Drawings don't really contain gravity. An object can be floating and it doesn't really matter. But I think there's just some part of me that can't get rid of that idea that a floating object will fall. And so I think, I think that's why I wanted to make a kind of grounding, heavier shape, lower in the image. I think that sort of gives the eye a place to land, and it, and it kind of contrasts with this little shape up here. It's also big, but it's not sharp, which, which basically I don't really, when my eye moves around this image, I don't really spend time with this shape. I kind of like arc around it and it sends me back around. Ooh, have we lost our camera? All right, looks like we lost our camera. Hold on one second. Let me just turn that back on. OK. So like I was saying, this curve here kind of sends me around. And that brings me to why I put these lines here. Before, it was just kind of two shapes floating in space, and they had no real relationship to each other. And they had no relationship to like this upper quadrant here. I think if I had put another like big, like sharp element, like another triangle here, first of all, it would risk looking like a face. And people are very inclined towards seeing faces in the things that they draw if those things are abstract. That's actually a problem um, that you might have to fight when you're trying to make an abstract drawing. Um, and you can usually accomplish that just by turning your drawing upside down. If you find that you're accidentally making a face and you don't want to be, uh, maybe reorient your drawing. Um, because uh, I have found that uh, seeing abstract faces is really orientation dependent. Um, OK, so anyway, I didn't want to put like an identical element on the other side of the page. Because yes, that would be balanced, but it's balanced in a really boring way. I'm not making a drawing so that it'll be balanced. I'm making a drawing so that it'll be interesting. So I wanted to balance it out with something that was slightly different. And so I wanted to connect this shape to this shape with a kind of movement. I wanted to break up the nature of the shapes 
So I wanted to make, so I made this, this shape out of lines instead of making another outline. If I made another outline, it might be too blobby, too samey. I think I just wanted a little variety. And then finally, I felt like it was all a little too heavily focused in this area. And I wanted to kind of give it a, like, I'm thinking about the curl underneath the letter G, or like the way that the letter Y kind of hangs underneath um, all of the other letters in a, in a word in English. Um, there's something about uh, an element that's sort of dipping its toes in the water. It's below the floor just a little bit. I don't know how to explain it, but it kind of helps hold everything together. So I wanted to put these dots here, slightly different than this. They, uh, I think, attract your attention more than this element does, but they're also smaller and they're sort of farther from the center. So I think you kind of circle around this way. We avoid this part of the, of the image a little bit, and if I were making like a really thorough drawing, I'd probably go back in and add another element here. But then something else happened, and I realized I wanted to make, I think I wanted to repeat the same texture over on this side of our big blobby shape. I did that for a couple of reasons, and one was so that I could demonstrate something else, which is that all of a sudden we have a kind of illusion that emerges really quickly. So check this out. I'm curious how many of you watching felt like this, these dots continue behind this shape onto this side. Does that make sense? Obviously they don't. There's no space, the dots aren't real, we're not drawing anything. But really quickly, our brains interpreted an abstract gesture to mean something physical, to imply that now there's a space behind this big shape where these dots can continue. Uh, maybe they're stars, maybe it's dust, and maybe not everybody feels that way about that element, but I suspect that many people do. So this is one of the things that comes up in abstract drawing. It's kind of like the emerging face. All of a sudden, we have an interpretive element. We have an element that implies the existence of space. All of a sudden, this abstract drawing is maybe a drawing of some kind of, I don't know, a space. It's, it, it implies that these shapes uh, exist in front of and behind each other, even though we know for a fact that they don't. So let's try this again. I'm going to get out a fresh page, and I want you guys to follow along with me. My, uh, my co-teacher, Joshua McCormick, showed me this one. And what we're going to do is we're going to make a bunch of compositions. So we're just going to draw a bunch of boxes. You guys are going to discover just how sloppy I really am at drawing. I want you to follow along and make, uh, we're going to make eight boxes, roughly the same size. Okay, so these are going to be our thumbnails. And they're going to provide, provide us with lots of different opportunities to make and try out different compositions. So in each one of these boxes, I want you to put some kind of a shape. Anywhere in the box, I want you to try different shapes, different types of marks, and put them in different places. So just like experiment, throwing off your composition a little bit. And then each box, we're going to work towards balancing that composition with a different kind of gesture. Um, we don't have to spend too much time on it because you could do this forever. So, uh, like, you know, if you've ever if you've ever made an abstract painting, um, or if you've ever seen anyone make an abstract painting, or if you've even ever just like seen an abstract painting up close in a museum or something, um, the complicated ones take an extraordinary amount of time to finish. And 
I can't speak to what everyone is experiencing as they paint. But for me, with one mark, and then I respond with another mark, and then I respond with another mark, and then another mark, and then a pattern starts to emerge, and then I respond to the pattern, etc., etc., it just goes on and on. It's this thread of decisions, each responding to each other, each reacting to your emotional appraisal of the thing that's in front of you, um, trying to balance it out, trying to make it make sense, realizing that you have some intention embedded within the painting that you didn't even know you approached the painting with, or that you have some kind of presumption that you're bringing to the painting that you didn't know you brought to the painting. These are like little mini trial runs of that experience. And to be honest with you, it's, it's, one of the, it's one of the best things in the world, in my opinion. It's one of my favorite things in the world to do because you just make a decision and the decision you make doesn't really matter. It just sets a chain of events um, in action. It just, it just all of a sudden, it necessitates all of these other gestures that follow from it. So we're going to try that out. But again, I bring all that up to say that you don't have to work on this for like 200 hours because you hope that it'll be in a museum or whatever. Um, this is just all going to be about trying to feel those little like differences in balance, trying to like understand why we react to drawings the way that we do. Um, and if you've made it this far in the video, I so appreciate uh, your willingness to try something different because I know this is really different uh, from what we normally do. And I just really appreciate that you're following along and trying this out. Okay, so. I'm gonna put a mark here, a little swirly mark. I think it's really high up, so I wanna do this guy. And then that's really off to one side, so I'm gonna do that. Uh, and I wanna put that there. And I'm going to leave it alone. <laughs> I can keep doing this forever, so I'm going to make myself stop. On this one, I'm going to put a little square here. And I'm going to color it in. I think I want to do this. Feel, I feel as though I've made a terrible mistake. This is what's weird about abstract drawing is it's, it just seems like there are good and bad decisions. I don't even know how to explain it. It's totally weird. I think you can only like, you can only get it by just like trying it. Oof. I'm embarrassed by that one. Which is also, you know, I recognize and am voicing that opinion just to communicate to you guys that, like, I know that that doesn't make any sense. Like, why am I embarrassed by that one? But I am. I'm like, it's a bad drawing. <laughs> and that's so weird. What is, I don't even know what it is. I'm discovering it as I'm doing it. But I feel distinctly that the first one is pretty good and the second one isn't good at all. And I guess I'm just expressing that out loud, not, uh, uh, not to encourage you to beat yourself up, which you certainly should not, and you have to work hard to not beat yourself up, and I have to work hard to not beat myself up, but to make it clear that I am feeling something about these drawings, um, and I bet you are too. You just have to kind of figure out how to listen to that little voice that's making weird, weird judgments about your drawing that are hard to understand. Okay, so let's do another one. Cool. And then, there we go. 
And let's try this one. I like that one. Notice how, how different it feels when we have an image of bound shapes, shapes that are closed off, taking up space. It implies a whole lot of stuff. It, um, and you know, this is in part my background in cartooning and in studying cartoons and in studying um, inking styles. That's a part of uh, where I come from academically. Um, but the idea of an outline holding space, an outline being a container for a presence, that's a really specific kind of mark. And so if you look at like the difference between this shape, which looks cartoony but plausible as a kind of abstract, maybe ballooning uh, kind of object, and this drawing where it's cartoonish, but it doesn't actually seem like these closed shapes hold an object. They're, they're, they don't make any sense in space. They act more as abstract closed lines than anything else. This shape is fundamentally different than this shape. And all both of these shapes are fundamentally different than the uh, lines that aren't enclosed at all. These lines are much more, um, they're further from depicting anything in space than the sort of bound shapes are. Um, so if I were interested in really trying to be like pure about making marks on paper, having them be interpreted as marks on paper, um, then I would s kind of stay away from bound, enclosed, or like really uh, implied spaces or shapes, if that makes sense. Um, I know this is very, very abstract, but I think you can probably feel that there's a categorical difference between how you interpret something like this and how you interpret something like this and how you interpret something like this, even though they're all abstract drawings made by the same person with the same materials, literally like minutes away from each other. So let's make another one. So I want you to think, too, about how darker marks pull us in a certain direction. They pull the eye towards this side. So now we have this kind of wild gesture, like broken up over here. Um, I even, uh, in an abstract way, I even start to interpret because I have one, uh, there's one dark mark there in the middle of uh, some kind of a shape. I almost interpret that shape to be animate. I almost interpret it uh, to be like a person. It doesn't exactly look like a drawing of a face, but um, it looks like it could be some kind of uh, like a conscious being. Um, and again, I recognize that that uh, doesn't really make any sense, but I think um, that's something worth thinking about. Uh, people really are inclined towards attributing sentience to abstract shapes. Oh no, I think my camera might be kaput. I think my camera has overheated. I'm, I'm almost certain that that is the problem with us streaming. It's so dang hot in this apartment. All right, so I'm just going to end up, I'm just going to draw on this camera. I think it'll work fine. Uh, so just to show you what I was talking about, uh, this object right here, I'm kind of thinking of it as like a person. I don't know how to explain it. And that's not all I think of it as. But there's some, there's some kind of um, abstract attribute that makes it feel like it's present, like it's watching, uh, like there's some kind of uh, consciousness in there. Um, and none of that is very, like, none of that is a strong feeling. It's just like a, a, it's just like a flash. It's like a little moment. Okay, so uh, let's do another one. So... Oh, I'm going to do this upside down. This actually might be really cool. All right, we're going to make the best of this. So I'm going to do this drawing.
Okay, so here's what you see. I think that works pretty well. And here's what I was drawing. This is, I don't know if you guys have encountered this before, but it's actually a recurring joke in like cartoons and in sitcoms that nobody can tell which way an abstract image goes. The joke being because it doesn't matter, because abstract art isn't real or whatever, like because we're not actually dealing with anything substantial or real. But uh, I'm gonna show you that again, just, just to sort of clarify it. Um, it's totally different depending on which direction you look on it for. Uh, depending on which uh, which way you orient it. Um, and I think you'll find, actually, that some of your drawings might be way better upside down than they are right side up. Kind of hard to explain why. This is actually one of the things that I do when I'm making an abstract image. I, I don't work on it... Um, how can I explain this? I don't work on it from every angle, but I do sometimes flip it around, flip it upside down, just to see if I'm missing something that would help hold it together a little better. If it looks really good from like oriented one way and then looks really bad oriented another way, that might actually be an issue with the way that you've balanced your composition out, with the, with the way that the weight of your attention is distributed when you're looking at the page. Um, you, you, might, uh, you might just be used to looking at it in one orientation, and then by turning it a certain way, you go, oh, I'm constantly sort of falling off the page over here, right? And then when you turn it back over, you'll notice like, oh, that's also happening when I look at the image right side up. I'm kind of falling up or, you know, whatever the issue with the image is. Um, and that's often, I'm using that as an example, but that's often an, an, an issue with abstract drawings is that your drawings lead the eye towards uh, out of the image. So then it's actually hard to get a person to spend time looking at the choices you've made because your choices are constantly leading them off the edge. They're constantly kind of like falling away. Um, and if your image is really boring, <laughs> then they, uh, they look at it, maybe they're held by it, but there's kind of nothing to like root around in. There's nothing to follow. There's nothing to discover. Um, yeah, so anyway, okay, here it is again. We're going to do two more. Please, please, please send me these drawings. You can uh, message me on Instagram at at c.manion. That's M-A-N-I-O-N. It is my last name. Um, I'm going to do these two more drawings. I would love, love, love to see your drawings. I so appreciate that you're watching. Doing lots of dots today. I like this one. It reminds me of like a newspaper layout or something. Here it is. Upside down. All right. And finally, here's our last one. I'm going to do another bold mark that I've got to deal with. Now i got to deal with this mark. I'm feeling loose right now. It's nice. Looseness makes nice drawings. Yeah. <laughs> My roommates are home where I would have I would have yelled. Yeah. We're doing it now. We're drawing now. Ah, uh, this one sucks though. Okay, hold on. <laughs> Okay, so here's what I'm trying to work out. 
I think putting this mark touching the edge of the page, that's the first time I did that the whole time I was making these compositions. I didn't do that on purpose. I wasn't trying to create a pattern where I uh, keep the marks off the edge, but it just made intuitive sense for me to do that. And I want you to look for things like that in your drawing. Are you using the same kinds of shapes over and over again? And that's not a bad thing. There's nothing wrong with uh, using the same kinds of gestures over and over again. It's something that's worth noticing because it's interesting that you're making that choice. Why wouldn't I put marks that touch the edge of the page? That seems like a weird, uh, really distinct choice that came up in all of these things. So once I did, then I felt totally like free to do all kinds of things. And I made it another little object that looks very similar to this object. And then I made a third kind of like abstract but kind of wishy-washy shape. And so now I'm trying to figure out how to balance your attention because I feel like really these shapes are pretty clear, but then these two, I don't know, their relationship doesn't, doesn't really work for me. Like they're not different enough to make me want to jump from one to the other, but they're not like similar enough that it seems like a pattern. So it kind of like reads weirdly, it kind of grates on me, like a weird flavor. I don't know how to explain it. And then this one, uh, this one, sorry, I got to do it backwards. This one is, it's complicated now, but just because I had to dig around in there to try and make it interesting enough that the eye would want to circle back. So now this one seems like overworked and strange when all of these other shapes were really quick, really like simple. Notice I didn't go over any of my lines multiple times, whereas in here, it seems kind of confused. It's like unclear what I meant it to be. It also seems kind of shaded and spatial. So those are the kinds of things that um, you can get really caught up in, these like abstract ideas where I could just continue saying, okay, well, in order to make it seem as if uh, that gesture was intentional, um, then I'm going to go back in and sort of muddy some of the other gestures that I made so that like some of them seem really deliberate and some of them seem kind of like uh, fastidious and like wishy-washy and kind of like scratchy. Um, so, uh, uh, oh, I hope my microphone isn't going into chipmunk mode. I just received a comment from my producer, Dan, that uh, maybe uh, my microphone is chipmunky. At least it was before. Okay, well, anyway. Um, in summary, because we're actually running out of time, I can't believe uh, how long that took. I was actually worried I wouldn't be able to fill the time. Um, I hope you have enjoyed exploring some of these weirder, more abstract aspects uh, of of drawing. And we're gonna we're gonna dig into this a little bit more. Um, and I'm also I'm gonna do a little bit more research so I have like a better vocabulary to articulate the things that are going on. Um, I used to, when I was at Ohio State, I uh, lived with a dancer named Quentin Burley, and I used to hang out um, with uh, some of the folks in the dance department. And I recently uh, came to understand that there's this distinction in dance, uh, in modern dance, uh, between somatic dance and other kinds of dance. And somatic dance is about not dancing for the sake of being seen, or rather not thinking about what is being seen when you dance but thinking about how you feel in your own body as you dance. And I would say that this way of drawing, this way of making abstract images is definitely analogous to somatic dancing. This is a kind of somatic abstraction. It's about putting marks on a page, seeing how you feel about them, and then following your instincts and trying to construct a good drawing out of those instincts. And if you're curious, like, well, you know, this seems really confusing, or I don't feel anything, or I'm not sure how I feel, or I feel very strongly, and I'm consistently making decisions in the drawing that seem to make it worse, like my drawings just get worse and worse. You know, I can definitely relate to that, and I feel like, especially when I was younger, when I was a teenager, I would make all kinds of drawings that would just get darker and darker and darker, because I would fill the page with graphite. I would just make decision after decision, retconning my, my previous decisions, 
um, just continually trying to justify the way that things were turning out until my page was, was just covered in marks. And then I would have to start using an eraser to remove marks to even make sense of the drawing. And don't get me wrong, I think um, that way of working can actually be really interesting. It gives the piece a kind of history, and you can make wonderful marks with an eraser on a dark page. But my point is that if you're looking for more confidence in what kinds of marks to make, I'd say look at some great paintings. Look at some great uh, drawings. I know you can't go to a museum right now, but um, the Art Institute of Chicago has much of its collection um, scanned and online, just like available to view. And if you're looking, especially if you're doing drawings uh, with like an inky Sharpie like I am, or if you even like to use India ink, look at the Billy Ireland Cartoon Library and Museum's online archive because cartoonists are great at using ink. And they, they make really small gestures in little boxes that hold together often as abstract compositions. People don't talk about cartooning this way. Rarely, cartooning, uh, rarely is cartooning abstract. But um, I think cartoonists don't actually get enough credit for being um, extraordinary uh, designers of space. You know, they, um, they make these, these amazing gestures, and they often do it quickly and with like an inky brush. And you'll notice if you look at uh, Bill Watterson, I think is a great example of this, the guy who did Calvin and Hobbes. If you look at those lines around Calvin and around Hobbes, uh, one line will go from being very, very thin to being very thick. And that's literally one gesture of, Cal of uh, Bill Watterson's brush. He's pressing down really hard to get the thick line and then lightening it up and making a gesture. And he has other things he's worried about. He's writing, you know, comics are more, are more complicated uh, than just addressing these abstract elements. But these abstract elements exist in almost any image. So look around, look for, um, look for great drawings, look for great paintings, uh, and try this out, practice. Um, and yeah, please send me your drawings. I wanna see them. Okay, uh, so thank you so much. I've been Charlie. Thank you to Firebird Community Arts. I so appreciate them for supporting me and for supporting this project. And if you are looking for a way to help the West Side through the ongoing COVID-19 crisis and to support the Black Lives Matter movement, trying to bring resources into this neighborhood to help this community, Happy Gallery in Ukrainian Village is accepting donations and they are, are and have been passing out food and medical supplies uh, consistently. They're just like a pickup point. People can go to Happy Gallery in Ukrainian Village and pick up supplies that they need. Um, it's a really good cause. They're also a cool gallery, and um, they have been doing really good work in Ukrainian Village from the moment there was a need. They snapped to it and um, organized for the neighborhood, so I, I super um, love to see that. And so if you want to support somebody, uh, that's, uh, that's a place to do it. So thank you very much.